Good morning. I spent a lot of time being a Zen Buddhist early in my life. And when I first came to a religious science church, they said they were going to do a meditation. And the person who was doing the meditation kept talking about the meditation and talking about the meditation and talking and talking and then said, thank you for being at our meditation. And in the back of my mind, I'm going, when are we going to meditate? And it's like, we never did meditate. We never had silence. So I love that reading today that comes out of the Joyous Living Journal. And I'm not sure if you're aware of it or not, but I know Reverend Sue, I believe it was, who started this journal at the beginning of the year. Um, and all the talk titles uh, for the year are ta being taken out of this uh, Joyous Living Journal. And if you're not following along with this, just know that there are those of us who are following along. And it's a wonderful thing to do a community spiritual practice together. I think we're out of these currently at the bookstore, but if, uh, if you're interested, you can let the bookstore people know and they will bring more in. So um, I would invite you to follow this. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Intuition. A couple of friends of mine like to say, I never go into my mind alone. It's too scary. Some of us feel that way, right? And we're talking today about the wilderness of intuition. I love that, that, that phrase. The minute I saw that title, I went, ooh, that's so rich and so deep and so, mm. Wilderness. When we think of wilderness, we have all these different connotations for wilderness, don't we? Okay. It can be a place of beauty. It can be a place of terror. It can be a place where we are thinking of simply the energy and the resources that we can take out of it, the profit we can make from the, the stuff in there. It can be a place to go and renew ourselves spiritually. It can be all of these things to us, right? Wilderness has all these connotations depending on what? The, the eyes with which we see it, right? Right? Here we go. We're just going to do it. Yes? We bring our consciousness to that of what is it that we believe a wilderness is. And so when we talk about the wilderness of intuition, when we talk about the experience of being and working with our intuition, we bring our own idea of what that will be to us. And so for some of us, being in our intuition is really comfortable. And for some of us, it's like, haven't been there in decades, don't want to go right now. And so just know that that's, what, wherever you're at with that, it's okay. But our intuition, I love Ernest Holmes' definition of intuition. Intuition is God in man, revealing to him the realities of being. It is the ability of man to know without any process of reasoning. God knows only intuitively. So when we're playing with intuition, we're playing in the language, we're playing in the conversation, we're playing in the mind of God. I'd like to say it's, it's we are being in the image and likeness of God. As it says in the Bible, we are created in the image and likeness of God. And when we are playing in intuition, we are, we are being in that image and likeness. And when we're not in our intuition, when we're in our egoic separate mind, we're being in the Adamic consciousness, the Adam and Eve consciousness of, of, of having eaten of the knowledge of the fruit of the tree of good and evil. Say that five times real fast with me. We've eaten of the knowledge of the fruit. Of, I don't say it with me. <laughs> but thank you, Luke. But we've eaten of that fruit, and that fruit is the either-or consciousness, the right-wrong consciousness, the there's this and then there's that consciousness that we talked about last week. Intuition is our quantum physics thinking. The rational mind, the separate mind, the egoic mind, is our Newtonian thinking where everything looks fixed and mechanical and just right, and we're looking for the right answer, right? right. Thank you, good, cue. And all that stuff. Whereas the intuitive mind is not necessarily logical. It's deeply wise, but it sees holistically rather than in pieces and parts. When we're in our rational mind, we look at problems and try to figure out solutions. When we're in intuition, we see the holisticness and allow the parts to simply fall in place. The holistic is where God works. A 
But in order to be in the holistic consciousness, in order to be in our intuition, we also have to be willing to be in the state of uncertainty. That's the good news and the bad news. We have to be willing to live in the state of uncertainty. This past week I was talking with a choir and Judy Preble is stepping down as the music director at the end of this season, which is the end of the season being the end of this month. So coming right up. And there was at one point in time a, a sort of designated for who was going to take over the choir director. And I said, you know, after I came in, being the new kid on the block, I said, time out. I want to have some say in this process and let's, let's look at some other options. And so right now some people in the choir, well, the choir is in a state of we don't know what's coming next. And for some people, they're excited about that. Because that's an exciting state to be in, isn't it? Sometimes. And for some people, they're in the state of panic and, oh my God, we don't know what's coming next. Because the rational mind likes to have all of its solutions and answers worked out, right? Right? An aside. I grew up in Seattle Church, Kathy Ann Lewis's church. For a long time, people gave her a bad time about being a controller, and she started to try and work with being you know, less controlling and less controlling and less controlling. And finally, one Sunday, she just, she'd had a breakthrough. She just came out and said, I'm controlling. Get over it. <laughs> I like to be right. Get over it. And you can say the same thing about whatever it is for years, too. So when we're into it, in the intuition, we are in the interconnected, we are in the holistic way of thinking we start to function in the image of God. The challenge we have is to let go of our human thinking, to let go of our human thinking. It likes to be right. It likes to have the answers. It likes to have things under control and systematized. Now, here's the deal. A lot of the time, that works really well in our lives. You don't want to go into, into you know, intuitive thinking every time I get into my car. How is this going to operate? What is the deep <laughs> meaning of the motor of my car? You know? You don't want somebody, you know, if, if, you're going, if you're getting on an airplane to go fly someplace, you don't want a pilot who's sitting there going, what is my mission in life? What is the, you know, there's a time and a place for everything. So it's good, the rational mind is not a bad thing to be in. It's just a bad thing when we're locked in that as our only way of functioning in the world. Got it? Both work well. We need both. But so often in our culture, we're so trained that there's only the one way of viewing the world that we forget to listen to the other way. I had a little experience. I stopped by this morning on the way um, in here to the, uh, um, from the Hearth Bakery. And I know we can't advocate political candidates from the pulpit and still maintain our 501c3 status, but I'm going to put in a plug for that's a darn good bakery there. <laughs> I'm sure there's others in town too. I just haven't discovered them yet. Um, but I was backing out, I was getting ready to, I got in my car, I got my, I got in my prize, and I got in, in the car and was getting ready to back out, and somebody just said, wait a moment. And it was just that little intuitive voice, and I just stopped and waited. Now, nothing happened particularly, but that's how the intuition is. See, our rational mind wants to get an answer. Go, 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 right now. Fast, fast, fast. That's the rational mind. Got to have a solution. The intuition says, Wait. Take a breath and wait. And out of that, something new may develop. So the intuition invites us to wait. But in that waiting is the wilderness. In that waiting is the area that we don't know. See, the, uni the, the wilderness is that untamed, unsanitized, undeveloped area. If you're in the wilderness, you can't, if you decide that you're a little bit hungry, go over to the nearest little cafe or stop in a Starbucks and have a coffee in the middle of the wilderness, right? Can't do that. It's the place where we go, in fact, to get away from all that stuff. So our rational mind, our normal way of operating, focuses on the parts, doesn't see the whole. Again, an experience that I had coming in here was I wanted to, I started talking about, let's upgrade the music program, let's see what we can do with the music program, and I was told, here's our budget. Now, our budget is a part. The upgrading the music program is the vision, the whole. It doesn't depend on the budget. 
The budget has an influence on it, but it doesn't depend on the budget. And so do we look at the part, and oftentimes we do it this with ourselves. We look at something, we say, this is what I really want to do. I want to go to that workshop. I want to buy that piece of clothing. I want to have this for my vision. I want to do something. And then we look at our checkbook to determine whether we can or can't. Yes? Yeah. Anybody besides me? Rather than saying, this is my vision. Okay, here's my checkbook, and that's what's in it right now, and that doesn't cover everything for that vision. So, if I have this vision, if this is truly the calling of my soul, if this is truly the calling of my heart, I simply allow it to develop and to show up as what it's supposed to be. And what I find is when I start to listen to my intuition, when I start to let the vision develop, all sorts of stuff falls in place. There's that, old, there's that quote by um, uh, W.H. Murray that... Yeah, where, where there's hesitancy, there is all that stuff. But it's, it's basically until you step foot, until you go for what you want, you will get nothing. And once you go for what you want, providence will show up with all sorts of unexpected ways of making it happen. And he said that because he had been invited by Sir Edmund Hillary to go on the climb of Mount Everest with him. And he didn't have the money. Now, when you're in, in mid-1930s England and, and Sir Edmund Hillary invites you to go on a climb of, of Everest and you're a mountaineer, it's like, I mean, this is the chance of a lifetime. You don't want to get caught with no money in your pocket. He said he first hesitated, he got scared, and he said he finally booked passage to India. In those days, you didn't just take a hop a jet over to Nepal. You, you booked passage on a ship to India. That was his commitment. That was his putting the money down. I've watched so many people that if they want to go through practitioner training, if they want to take a class, if they want to go to a workshop and they don't know how they're going to afford it, they put the deposit down. They say, I'm going. This is my step out in faith and do something. You step out in faith and start. You hear the vision, you listen to your intuition, you know, is this my ego wanting to go to that? Oh, all my friends are going to be there, I need to be there too. Or is this my intuition saying, no, I really belong there. This is truly my calling. And you start to do something with that, you start to take a step. Our rational mind will not take us to our highest good eventually. It will help us to function on this level just fine, but it will not take us past the level where we're at. We talk about expanding our mental equivalent. We talk about growing into something greater in our lives. Our rational mind will not get us there. As we talked about last Sunday, you can't get there from here when you're in the rational mind. We have to move into there, wherever there is, and let it pull us forward. That is a heart and soul journey. The way to access your intuition is to start to listen to your heart. Do that for a moment now. Just listen and notice what wants to come up. What is it that's been tugging on you for a while that you've been saying, mm, don't want to hear that, don't want to hear that? This month's um, Science of Mind magazine has an interview with uh, the singer Indy Ari. I don't know if I'm even pronouncing her name right. And she talks about, you know, she, she's, she's had a, a, a pretty good you know, career of, uh, as a musician, and she was in the middle of doing her next album when suddenly her intuition said, stop. Stuff started going weird with the album, and it just said, stop. Now, just like most of us, when you're doing an album, you have certain things invested. There's money, there's time, there's resources, there's ego, there's, all sort of, there's expectations of other people, there's all this stuff. And so she'd already laid down tracks. She'd already, you know, I mean, done all this stuff. And here comes this, e this intuition that says, stop. And she followed the intuition. What she said was she took a while and, and stepped back, and she re regrouped, worked with her regular songwriting partner, brought in a couple of other songwriters, brought in some musicians from Turkey to give a whole different flavor to the music and created an album that, that has just come out they, they talk about called um, Songverse, I believe it is, which is, is kind of discussions with or conversations with, songversation, that's what it is, songversation. So it's, do we have the guts? Do we have the, 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 both the ability to hear and then the guts to follow the intuition when it leads us into that wilderness of the unknown? 
And oftentimes it'll say, stop what you're doing. Stop what you're doing. Do something different. Do we have the courage as we step into the wilderness to say, yes, I'm willing to do that? There's another quote from, I think it was yesterday's uh, Meditation in Science Mind magazine. It was, it was a, it's, this is a quote that's oftentimes attributed to, I'm going to butcher his name because I always have, uh, Guillaume Apollinaire, who was a French uh, poet and, and artist in the early part of the 1900s. Um, but it was actually written by Christopher Logue about him. And he says, come to the edge, he said. We might fall. Come to the edge. It's too high, all in capitals. Come to the edge. And they came, and he pushed, and they flew. Our intuition invites us to come to the edge, and our rational mind goes, it's too high, we might fall, I might die, whoa, you know, I might fail. Do we have the courage to listen to the intuition? And not only listen, but follow. Our intuition pulls and pushes us out of our safety and comfort zone. It will always do that. That's its job. Because we get comfortable, right? You know, right now, I, I don't have a house to live in, a place to live, and, and, and there's this little part of me that's really uncomfortable because it's like, I want my stuff around me. I want to get established in my daily routine. I want to have my comfort. Instead, I'm hanging out here in this kind of interesting no man's land wilderness area where I get to play and do something different. And so I'm beginning to sit and ask the spirit, what is it that's mine to do right now? I've had a couple of answers that have come. One of them is to be of service to the person who's, who I'm staying with. The intellect, or excuse me, the intuition knows they can fly. The mind of separation is afraid of flying. It knows we'll die. We also have to be gentle with ourselves and learn to trust our intuition slowly. Many of us have had times where we've been authentically ourselves when we were young and gotten rather slapped down for it, shamed for it, anybody besides me, right, okay? You know what that experience is like. And so oftentimes for that, we shove our intuition away and we say, oop, that gets me in trouble. That gets me in trouble. I need to start doing what they think is the best thing to do. So gently begin to follow your intuition. Gently begin to learn what it sounds like. I used to, when I first started really listening to the, to the intuition, I was living in Los Angeles. I'd be driving down the freeway, and I would hear a little hint that said, why don't you take this exit real quickly? And I'd ignore it. And I'd come around the bend, and all the traffic would be stopped for an hour. And I'd be sitting there going, dang, I should have listened to that. Anybody else have that? Not necessarily in Los Angeles, but you've had that. I would, of course, take a hammer out and beat myself up for it. That was my pattern at the time. The wiser way that I've learned is, rather than taking a hammer out and beating yourself up, oh, man, I should have listened to that, is... Say, okay, that's what the intuition sounds and feels like. Yeah, I should have learned, I wish I would have listened to it, but now at least I know what it feels like, and now I can listen to it more easily. If I'm just beating myself up, it's just I'm shaming myself more, and I'm just kind of pounding the whole thing down. So it's like, what does it feel like? What does it sound like for me? Because your intuition will show up in a way that's unique to you. For some people, it's visual. For some people, it's a voice. For some people, it's a kinesthetic feeling. Some people get God bumps when they're kind of getting into that. You know, there's a little, or there's a little, what I call a click within, you know, that you sort of kind of get that little settled feeling. It's like, oh, yeah, that. Okay. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. yes. So notice what your voice of your intuition sounds, feels, what your experience is with it. Sometimes it's different. I've had times when, when it's been a voice. Sometimes it's been a very loud voice. I was one time doing some photography at, at um, Point Lobos, just south of Monterey, and it was the day after Thanksgiving. There had been a huge storm passing through. There were these wild waves crashing against the, the rocks. And there's this particular rock. I used to love to do uh, nature photography of, of detail, 
uh, uh, details of nature. There's this particular large rock that was um, probably about as big as this whole platform up here that I wanted to, that I had seen a detail on that I really wanted to go capture. But it would take me a little bit to set up the camera and get down you know, really close and do the photography. So I'm watching the waves. And it's quite a ways away from you know, where the waves were crashing. The biggest wave, I count through 10 waves because I'm told that there's cycles of seven in the waves and I just wanted to add a little extra comfort zone. So I counted through 10. You know, and the biggest one came just as a little dribble around the base of the whole thing. So I said, okay, good, I'm good with that. So I'm sitting down here, I'm studying the detail of this thing. And all of a sudden this voice very loudly says, look up. And it wasn't anybody else's voice. I was the only person on the, anywhere near that rock. It says, look up. I should have the detail, I don't know how to swim. I turn around, and basically about as high as that painting right there is a wave, and about as close as that painting right there is a wave heading straight for me. It's the day that I learned about what they call wild waves in the Pacific. And so I had a moment to grab the rock that was over here, I had the camera and the tripod, you know, the camera is very important, so camera and tripod as high as I could get it up, grab this wave, turn around to my back, so my back was towards it, so if I got knocked off my feet, I was going forward where I could walk with it, rather than being knocked over backwards. I, I don't know why, but I had the presence of moment, in mind to do it in that moment. And comes, Bush comes through, the wave through, literally chest high, spray over my head. I had a friend who was a little ways away on the other side of the rock. He said, I watched you walk behind that rock. He says, I watched that wave come over. He says, I came over expecting to just find camera equipment floating to see if I could salvage any of it. I did not expect to see you. <laughs> Fortunately, that voice, boom, said, look up. And so sometimes that's how that sounds to us. And sometimes it is just a little gentle, small, you really got to pay attention to a voice. So in order to start listening to it, in order to start experiencing it, we have to practice, just like anything else. One of my favorite practices is one that we engaged in this morning with Reverend Sue called visioning. And visioning is simply the practice of sitting with the question of what is spirit, God's, my, my highest self's, highest idea about whatever this is in my life, whatever's going on in my life. And then sitting and listening. It's not trying to problem solve. So this morning I sat with the question of what is the highest idea for this, this Center for Spiritual Living in Roseburg, particularly in, in regards to my interaction with it. Reading. Roseburg. It's also a CSLR. Where am I today? Right here, right now. It's all one. Reading. Thank you. Maybe that's why I can't get a house. I think I'm in Roseburg. <laughs> Maybe it's a beautiful place for me to live in Roseburg. I can commute every Sunday. That was an interesting slip. What is the highest idea for Center for Spiritual Living Reading? It's particularly in my regard. And I just got this after all, this feeling of this, this gentle growth, this, this heart energy moving through this congregation, moving out beyond the walls of this congregation. And one of the things I came with was, and I didn't even realize I was quite carrying this, thought was, be gentle. I don't have to grow this church immediately. It doesn't have to be whatever it's going to be next week. Thank you, Reverend Sharon. It's working on what we'll call God's time, Spirit's time. It's working on the time that it's working on. It's unfolding the way that it's unfolding. All mine is to do is to facilitate that unfolding and to hold the heart energy in the space to where we, we collectively, can unfold in that way. And it takes a load off my shoulders of I'm responsible. How many of you have had that I'm responsible? I got to make it happen. And when we start to listen to our intuition, we start to get, no, I'm not. I'm responsible to be the best that I can be, but I'm not responsible for the outcome. Intuition looks at the whole picture. The egoic mind looks only at outcomes. It looks at one win and loss. It looks at what am I supposed to do. So we first learn to feel it and hear it, experience it. We sit in the silence, we practice, we ask deep questions of it. We bring questions. You bring questions of your life. If you're looking for a new car to buy, 
what's Spirit's highest idea for my new car? There's nothing that's too small or too mundane for the infinite. Because guess what? It's all the infinite. The most mundane little detail. Where are my keys? <laughs> the infinite knows. It's all one. Nothing's lost in spirit. So intuition doesn't operate the same way as the rational mind. One time when I was visioning with a group in Seattle, we were visioning on the idea of recreating the Wednesday night service. It had been, it had been let go for about a year because the attendance had been low. And, and a minister wanted to kind of recreate the service and see how to do it. And so she invited us, a group of us to come and vision. And so we're sitting there, we're doing this vision experience and, and, and starting the question, what is the highest idea for the Wednesday night service? And I'm sitting there, and my grocery list starts to show up in my mind. <laughs> I was going to go shopping afterwards, okay? And my grocery, and I'm a food person. My grocery list is you know, showing up in my mind. I'm like literally trying to go, go away. I'm trying to have a spiritual experience here. Get out of my mind. And my grocery experience keeps showing up. My grocery list keeps showing up. It <laughs> okay? Keeps on showing up. But I went, okay, fine. That's the vision. Grocery list. Whatever the heck that means. I didn't know what it meant. When we got finished with the visioning and started sharing what all we'd experienced, four other people had had visions of food, grocery lists, or something like that. And out of that, we came up with the idea of, let's create a dinner for the community prior to the Wednesday night service and see if people will attend that. And immediately, a couple of people said, I would love to do that. I would love to cook for the, you know, for the community and do that. We'll charge you know, 5 or $7, whatever it was, something, you know, just to cover the food. And we started to have this dinner that 150, 200 people would show up for every single Wednesday night. On their way home from work, they'd stop. Someone wouldn't even go to the Wednesday night service. They'd just stop and have dinner with their community, their friends. I'm seeing a grocery through this and trying to, you know, oh, that's not spiritual. I want to have a different experience. Sometimes we don't understand how it operates, but we go with it. We sit and listen with it. What does this mean? The wilderness has no paved trails. We don't know what we're doing. But I want to give another name for the wilderness. A name we used to call it a long, long time ago. And that is home. See, these days, most of us don't know how to operate in wilderness. Most of us don't know how to operate in our intuition. But we used to call our intuition home. I love the movie Avatar because it shows the, the, the dissonance, if you will, between two different ways of thinking. One is a group of people who is living by intuition in harmony with their world. And the other is a group of people who are living off of the ego mind that sees profit and loss, gain and loss, victory or loss. Get that loss part? Must win at all costs. Focus on one thing. I want the, the mineral that I can get out of here. And we're focused on that, and I don't care what the rest of the, the community is like. The rest of the world is like, I don't care how it affects that, not holistic. And it shows the difference in thinking between that. I invite you to pay attention this week to your thinking. Where are you in looking at just the problem, just the part, just the individualized little you know, thing that we have blinders on? And we all do it. Again, don't beat yourself up. Just notice. Just be aware and pay attention. And then begin to ask yourself, what's a different way of doing that? What's a different feeling that I might have? What is it that the universe, what is it that the infinite is trying to move through me? I like to think of it as the phrase that's in the Bible when, in the story of the prodigal son. But it says eventually the prodigal son came to himself. When we listen to our intuition, we are coming to ourselves. And what we find, just like the prodigal son found, is a father who wants to throw us a party, bring us great new clothes, a new ring, you know, and have a barbecue. Will you listen to your intuition? Practice with that this week. Just take some time. Take a moment to wait. Take a moment to listen. Take a moment to turn off the noise, as the reading said, and listen, not just to get quiet, but listen in the silence. We'll close with a reading from Ernest Holmes. Because we fail to realize that principle is not bound by precedent, that is, that God or principle does not care what came before. It isn't locked up in what came before. See, our rational mind is locked up in this happened, therefore, 
this is going to happen. I lost my job, therefore I'm going to be broke. I lost my relationship, therefore I'm going to be lonely. The doctor said I have this diagnosis, therefore I'm going to have this, or I have to do this, or whatever. It's locked up in that. Principle, the infinite, is not bound by precedent. And because we fail to realize this, we limit our faith to that which has already been accomplished, and very few miracles result. When through intuition, faith finds its proper place in divine law, there are no limitations. And what are called miraculous results follow. When we listen to our intuition, when we are willing to step into that wilderness, it will soon become a home, that you'll soon understand the flow and the beauty of it. You create miraculous results in your life. I invite you to play with that this week. So create some miracles, big ones, small ones, any kind of miracles in your life. You willing to do that? Yes. Great. Let's pray. It's a moving into that awareness, into that consciousness that there is only that one life, there is only that one infinite presence that isn't a conspiracy for our good because we are one of it. It's in a conspiracy for its own good. It is not against itself. The infinite presence is pure love, pure joy, pure good. It is opulent and abundant. It is the deep wisdom, the holistic seeing of the universe. And we are one of it. We always have been. Whether we forget or whether we don't forget, we still are one of it. There's nowhere else to be. And so we are that love. We are that wisdom. We are that, that abundant good, that joy. We are that. We're the vibrant, healthy life energy that is flowing through every mm, atom, subatomic particle, and space in between of this universe. We are that right now. And so I speak my word that we become ever more aware of it, that we listen with our intuition, that, that God thinking, that God language, that God spirit, infinite presence, whatever you want to call it, alignment that brings us back to the remembrance of the truth of who we are, that handles things great and small. That we listen to this. We hear it. We are willing to follow it. We say yes to that intuition. We say yes to that divine urge that moves through us. We let our fear fall away. We let the mind of separation have its conversation, but we listen more deeply and see if there's another alternative, see if there's another conversation happening. We listen, and then we act. We move our feet in alignment with that intuition. We say yes to the divine, and the divine says yes right back to us. Let's party. And so I give thanks for the good that is manifesting in each person's life this week. I give thanks for the intuition, the guidance, and the, and the voice, the feeling, the gut level nuances, the vision whatever it is, however it is that it communicates with each of us. I give thanks for all that, um, that transpires and, and unfolds this week for each person. And so in great gratitude, we turn the process of how this works over to that infinite mind that takes care of the how, and we focus on the what. We focus on the vision. We focus on the highest good. We say yes to that good, and the universe says yes right back. And it is made manifest in our lives here and now. And so it is. Thank you. Thank you, choir. You sounded wonderful. Does it sound good? Yeah. I buried Damien's reading, so he paid me back by ruffling up my papers, too. So we'll get everything straightened out up here. You know, Damien has uh, just won a uh, Toastmasters speaking, what a contest is, is contest is that fair to say? And is heading off to Reno, I believe, for.
where I believe he's going to be competing against a good friend of mine from Seattle, <laughs> who's also a religious scientist. But that one's a minister, so I know he's going to beat the heck out of you, Damien. I'm so sorry, but you know, his God's on his side. What can I say? No, <laughs> just teasing you. This is my church now, so you know, we're going to cheer for you. <laughs> not, not that Seattle stuff. And it's all God, isn't it? It's all God. So today we're talking about the wilderness of intuition, being in the wilderness of intuition. And I love that phrase. These, these talk titles, um, I don't know if you know, come out of the Joyous Living Journal, which I believe you started kind of at the beginning of the year as a spiritual practice. Is that correct? Yes? No? Yes, thank you. Reverend Sue says, yes, we definitely did. If you're not working with this book, you know, there's a number of us in the community who are, and you might want to pick one up out of the bookstore when they get them back. I think they're out right now, but they'll get more in. If, you, if you'll go to them and say, I want one, they'll get you one. So uh, it's a daily um, reading and affirmation, and, and I love this. You know, the reading that, that uh, Damien read was taken from just a couple of days ago, and I'm going to quote from, from that same reading in just a moment here to start us off. But uh, there's some wonderful ideas, some wonderful ways to start the day and, and to, to go deep with the process. And it's written by a couple of, actually, friends of mine who are religious science ministers, uh, um, Christian Sorensen down out of... Uh, um, Seaside and uh, uh, Petra Weldus out of Dallas, Texas, and so uh, and they're both wonderful ministers and they're wonderful readings. So I would I would highly encourage you to get it. It's the Joyous Living Journal. So we're going to start off with a quote out of this journal, and the the quote comes from Alan Alda. Yeah, he's actually a pretty darn spiritual guy, by the way. You have to leave the city of your comfort and go into the wilderness of your intuition. What you'll discover will be wonderful. What you'll discover is yourself. Isn't that great? So, we spend a lot of time not in our intuition, don't we? And we're, we get concerned because to the rational mind, to our normal mind, that, that intuitive process seems very ooey-gooey, not linear, not sure I can trust it, it tells me to do weird things, and we're afraid that it's going to tell us to you know, run naked down the middle of the street in, you know, or something you know, stupid like that, and we're going to have to follow our hearts. And so we, we kind of protect ourselves through the shell with, with, and I, I love the, the reading that we did with Damien, that, that you know, we, we protect ourselves with either internal or external noise so we don't have to listen to that still small voice within. At least I do. I don't know if anybody else does, but I sometimes do that. And the, the intuition feels like a wilderness. And wilderness brings up all sorts of connotations for us, doesn't it? It can bring up beauty and isolation. It can bring up that wonderful place to spiritually renew. It can bring up terror. It can bring up you know, the fact foreboding and darkness. It can bring up a potential for, for resources and, and trees to chop down and mines to dig and roads to pave and, and all that stuff. It can bring up all sorts of things depending on our filters that we're looking for it, at it with, correct? Thank you. <laughs> and so... What we bring to the idea of, in, of intuition, what we bring to the idea of wilderness, is how we will approach it. If it's a scary thing to us, we're going to push it away. We're going to keep that wall up and say, no, I'm not going there. I've heard that voice once. I got in trouble with that voice once. I'm not doing it again. What's true about the intuition and what's true about wilderness is it's an area that's not tame. It's not tame. See, we live lives, relatively speaking, if we're not really paying attention, but we live lives that are tame. We kind of have a schedule. We know what's going to happen today. We know what's going to happen next week. You know, we have an order of service. We know what's going to happen step by step. And I changed up the order of service today so that practitioners are kind of sitting there going, what are we doing now? And it's, you know, it, it's not safe. You know, it's, like, it's not the way we used to do it. You know, one of my mentors used to, used to say, and I, I almost did this for the first service, and I might do it with you guys, but uh, it'd be kind of a process to do. We, she'd be teaching the foundations class, and about the third week of foundations, she would notice that a lot of people were still sitting in the same chairs as every other week. 
And our conversation was, if you, how do you expect to change your consciousness if you can't even change your chair? <laughs> Next week, I expect you all to be sitting in different chairs. I won't do it right now. But if you have a chair, if you have your favorite chair, this is my chair, I invite you to move. I invite you to experience it somewhere else. To sit somewhere else in the sanctuary just to see what that's like. Just to see who's around you and what they're like. Play with that. So we step with intuition out into the unknown. We step out to where we can't just turn around and order a Starbucks coffee at the little coffee shop right in the corner because we're sitting out in the wilderness and there are no Starbucks coffee cups or coffee shops. We're sitting in the, in the intuitive process that doesn't have reference points as far as we understand them. There's a wonderful article in, in uh, the, um, this month's Science Mind magazine about Indy Ari who's a, a, a recording artist, a singer. And she was in the process of recording an album when she noticed everything was kind of getting sideways about the album. And her intuition said, stop. Just stop. Now, if you know anything about the music business, you know that it's not easy to just stop recording an album. Money has been laid out. Tracks have been laid down. Resources have been used. Egos are involved. Expectations are involved. Marketing is involved. All this stuff. And here comes the intuition and says, stop. What do you do? Fortunately, she stopped. She listened to that intuition. And she took a break. And what emerged from that break was she started working with some different songwriters. And she started working with some different musicians. And out of it came what she considers her best album to date. I know a number of people in the music business who I've, I've known, I, I, I used to be in that industry a long time ago when I was very young, and there are people I know who were recording stars who 20 years later, five years later, record an album and they say, that's the album I really wanted to record five years back, 20 years back, but I couldn't because there was too many expectations for me or my band or whatever to not record that album. They don't follow their intuition. There's all sorts of occasions where we have not followed our intuition. I, I was joking with the first service that when I lived in Los Angeles, I, when I was first starting to listen to my intuition, I'd be driving down the freeway and I'd get this little hint, you should take this exit quickly. And I'd say, you know, ignore that. Come around the corner and there's the traffic. Stopped completely for about an hour. And if I listened to that little voice, I would have taken that exit. Some of you have had that experience, yes? So we listen to our intuition. And what most of us do, by the way, I'm going to invite you not to, what most of us do is then we beat ourselves up. Man, I heard that. I should have known it. I should have listened to that. And then you just should have all over yourself. <laughs> what I'm going to invite you to do instead is to say, oh, that's what that sounds like. That's what that feels like. Because most of us are so unfamiliar with our intuition we don't know what it sounds like or what it feels like. Now, a lot of us here in this particular community, we do spiritual practice. I mean, the, the whole basis of our spiritual community is to get you in touch with your intuition, to get you in touch with, with listening to the infinite directly. Not by reading a book and seeing what it says about God or hearing what some person says about God, but for you to have the direct experience of that infinite presence. So I know that there's a higher, higher incidence of listening to intuition in this room than there is on a normal population. Yes? Yes. So you're smarter than the average coyote. <laughs> I just gotta say, by the way, this is an aside, because I was just on Facebook with a couple of my ministerial friends. Today is May the 4th be with you day. That's for those Jedi Knights with a lisp. <laughs> Some of you knew that. Okay, good. I, I, I want to be in touch with the times. So we can be in fear or excitement about our intuition. When, some, when we hear our intuition, we can move into fear, we can move into excitement. The ego mind, the mind that believes in separation, the mind that sees limited perspective, moves into fear. The mind that... that lives in intuition, gets excited. It says, ooh, something's shaking, something's moving. You ever been in an earthquake? Yeah. Something's shaking, something's moving. 
And we can either be in fear or we can enjoy the ride because you can't do anything about the earthquake. I mean, it's a good thing to get into someplace safe, you know, but, but, you know, but enjoy the ride. That's what the intuition is like. Uh, I was talking to a gentleman after the first service, and, and he said, you know, you, you really hit it. He said, it's like, do we get the excitement of the noise of the ego? I, I was walking from the meditation pavilion after we did our meditation. There was a motorcycle that had gone down the road rather loudly. And, you know, I was thinking, you know, that's perfect. That's the perfect summary of what the ego does. The ego makes noise. The ego honors noise. The ego loves noise. The intuition value is quiet. The intuition values stillness. But so often, as the reading said, we're so busy making noise that we don't hear that. There's a quote from Grace Slick, who was the lead singer of the Jefferson Airplane years ago, that said, everything we do either stinks or makes noise. <laughs> Isn't that a great quote? You start thinking about it, it's like, hmm. It's time to listen to the intuition. When Barbara, Reverend Barbara, was talking about how to resolve the situations in, in Ukraine and, frankly, situations throughout the world, we're not going to resolve them with our rational minds doing it the way we did it before. We have to do something new. We have to listen to our intuition. Listening to our intuition is like the prodigal son in the story when it says that he came to himself. When we're in our intuition, we are coming to ourselves. We are coming to our capital S self, if you will. And the universe responds in the way that the story that Jesus told with a party, a barbecue, new clothes, a new ring, and a complete welcome back. No guilt, no shame, no, you should have done this years ago. It doesn't care. It doesn't have a time frame. It doesn't have an agenda for you. Our intuition works now, yesterday, tomorrow, and for all of eternity. When are we going to listen is the only question. So the intuitive way, when we're listening to our intuition, intuition sees holistically. It moves from the whole to the parts. It sees the whole vision, and then it comes to the parts of how am I going to create that vision. It's a, it's a quantum perception in terms of, in, in the same way that I would say quantum physics. Quantum physics is comfortable in the unknown. In quantum physics, it's co-creating organically how the whole universe shows up, how everything shows up. It's kind of constant motion. There is no stayed, here is reality, and here is not reality. It's just, we're making it up as we go. The observer is observing, and the, that which is observed is being affected by the observer, and there's this dance going on, and that's how the intuition is. It is taking part in the dance of the spirit. It is taking part in the dance across the cosmic floor, the cosmic dance floor, with the infinite. And you and I are part of that dance. We are dancing with the infinite. Isn't that great? It's a good dance partner to have. Intuition begins with the vision and works out the how. It begins with the vision. And then it works out the how. With intuition, there's no limitation or lack. It doesn't perceive lack. It perceives the vision. It perceives what it wants to create through us. It doesn't get into the lack of limitation. And it's not bound by the past. It does not care what happened yesterday. When we go into ego mind, the mind that believes in separation, and I don't want to put ego mind down, because as I was saying to the first service, you don't want an airline pilot, when you get on your airplane, sitting there going, let me just contemplate the universe. What is my vision and mission for this? You know, you, you want somebody who's got their, their mind under control. If you get into your car, you want to kind of be operating from that rational mind, okay? So it's good to do that. It's not, it's not that it's bad to be in that consciousness. The only challenge is that most of us are locked into that consciousness as the only way of experiencing the world. The only way. There was that song that you guys sang right at the very start that, that you know, I, I bought myself a ticket I'm seeing only half the show. The intuition is the other half of the show. Most of us are not, you know, many of us are not working, many of the, us being the world, not necessarily you, but many of us in the world are not working in that way. And, and even us, 
as enlightened as we are and wonderful as we are, sometimes get caught up in that ego mind, how can I see, how can I solve this problem, how can I do this, and we don't think holistically. So this ego mind is a problem solver. It gets into the process, the how, without looking at the what. And so when I get into something that's feel called for, the first thing I look at is how am I going to do that? Oh, if I can't figure out how I'm going to do that, I'm not even going to consider it. How am I going to create the relationship I want? Oh, there's no good women, there's no good men, so I'm not even going to bother to try. Or this, you fill in the blank name that I've been married to for X number of years. He, she is never going to change, so why bother? That's getting into the how. We look at the how and we let it stop us. We try and problem solve at that level without seeing the holistic. It's a Newtonian perception of the universe. That is, the universe is a mechanical universe that operates in a certain way. It has a fixed way of operating that it's cause and effect. This happens, therefore this is going to happen, therefore this is going to happen. We go to the doctor, the doctor gives us a diagnosis, you have this disease, therefore you need to do this. And, and intuition says, oh, no, I've got a bigger picture than that. Rational mind says, oh, well, that's what happened, therefore I must do this. We look at our, our, our life experience, I only make this much money, therefore I can only buy this. I can only have this kind of a house, I can only have this kind of a car, I can only have this kind of an education, I can only do this. We look at our, our, our stuff and we let it limit us. That's what the ego mind does. It's rational, it's logical, but, it, but logic is that which falls step by step by step by step. The intuitive mind jumps. Logical mind, rational mind goes A, B, C, D, E, F. Intuitive mind goes A, M, Z. We're here. How we got here, I don't know, but we're here. I don't really care how we got here, we're here. And we got here holistically in a way that's, that's good for everyone. We're here. The ego mind looks at the parts, the ego sees the limitation, the lack, and the ego is both future-based or the future is based on the past and on our current circumstances. I love that word circumstances. Mary Manna Morrissey in her Prosperity Plus One class talks about circumstances. That literally means that which is standing around us. And what we do is we look at that which is standing around us to dictate what our reality is. But who, guess who created what's standing around us? And so we get locked into this loop that, oh, because of that, I can't do this. But I can't do this because of that. I, but that is causing me to not do We're back and forth, and we never break through. The intuition is the way out of that loop. The intuition is the way out of that catch-22 situation. So intuition, I like to think of it as picking up the broadcast that is always coming from the universe. The universe is always broadcasting its infinite wisdom. It's always on. What is our channel tuned into? What channel are we tuned into? If we, live, if we were to live in, a, in an environment where we had multiple TVs and radios going simultaneously, maybe the computer broadcasting a few simulcasts and stuff like that, and all this noise and cacophony hitting at us, and one of those stations was our intuition, which we call the still voice, what do we get bombarded with mostly? All the other stuff, yes? All the other stuff. And we drown out the intuition. That's why we were talking in the reading about the silence. Part of the way to practice intuition, part of the way to get in touch with your intuition is to practice, is, to, is just to stop the noise long enough to where it's the only voice left talking. Can I listen to this? Can I practice this? The visioning process, and Reverend Sue leads one uh, on the first Sundays of the month uh, out of the pavilion at 8 o'clock. But the pra practice of visioning, I love visioning because it's simply sitting and listening to the vision for whatever it is that we want to vision about. Whatever practice we want to vision about. And so it's doing something to get us into the exercise, the practice, the habit of that's what that station sounds like. That's what that station sounds like. Because most of us live in a culture that has trained us to drown out that station and listen to all the others. It drowns out the station when we listen to what our boss wants, what our spouse wants, what our kids want, what our parents want, what society demands of us, what our checkbook says we can do, what the doctors say we can do, what all the authority figures around say we can do, and we don't listen to the intuition. And so I invite you to take the time 
to listen. Focus your energy on your heart. Focus your energy on wherever it is you feel the most still and quiet in your body. And after you're still and after you're listening in that energy, to bring a question to it. Something that you'd like to have resolved in your life. And here's the kicker. There is no question either too big or too small for the infinite. It doesn't care if you're asking it what pair of shoes to buy next or what your mission in your career is next. It doesn't care. But if you listen from that heart, you'll start to understand the movement and how to move it forward. We were doing the visioning this morning. I began to listen. I began to ask the question of what is mine to do with expanding the Center for Spiritual Living here? It's just really what is mine to do with, you know, in my role of the Center for Spiritual Living here in Reading. <laughs> I accidentally named a different city that also begins with an R in the first service, and I was promptly chastised, so we will not do that again. <laughs> it's just up the road a little bit. I have no idea where it came from because I was only there for six months. What is mine to do? What is mine to be with this? And what came with mine is to be in the, gently in the heart energy and just simply allow the energy of this place to just naturally unfold and grow. Now what I realized once I listened to that, that my ego was saying was, you're responsible for growing this center and getting it together right away and doing all this expansion. And it had this humongous agenda for me. And I'm sitting there going, oh my God. You know, and by the way, it should be done next week. <laughs> Anybody else ever have that kind of stuff? Yeah. You're supposed to have your life together by at least next week, if not sooner. Last week would have been better. So when we start to listen to the intuition, it doesn't have that agenda. It reminds us that we're not the ones who are responsible for it anyways. We're playing in life, but we're not responsible for life. You know what? I can't make this center grow. <laughs> That's the joke. <laughs> I can be responsible for being the best I can be as a minister. I can be responsible for being loving, for bringing the deepest wisdom that I know, for being fully present with each of you. I can be responsible for that. That is all I can do. What comes as a result of that is not my responsibility. It's the universe's, the infinite responsibility. But I know that if I do that, something good is going to show up. Because I know that if I am in my honest, true self, if you are in your honest, deep self, Something good will come out of that. It has to. And the intuition is your guide for how to be in that self. And so it is so deeply important to listen to that. I want to remind people, because it was mentioned by somebody at the first service, this is going to rock your world. Men, you have intuition too. <laughs> We've heard that women's intuition all of our lives, right? But we really have it too. And it's okay to use. Be careful, I've got an intuition and I'm going to use it. <laughs> I'm not afraid to use it. So we gently, we have gently let ourselves start working with our intuition. Oftentimes we've had early life experiences where we've been shamed, where we've been put down, where we've been our authentic self and got slammed for it. Yes? We know. This is painful. Charles Holt, who in last month's magazine, talked about when he was, uh, who's a, a wonderful uh, singer, performer, a spiritual mind practitioner, um, talked about when he was five years old, he was in the living room uh, performing to a, a Michael Jackson, a, a Jackson 5 tune um, for his family, dancing and doing all this stuff, and his dad walked in the room and just started yelling at him, put that stuff away, get it off, you know, get those stupid clothes off you, there's no room for dancing and, and pirouetting in our, in our house. He said he grabbed all his stuff and ran up to his bedroom and, and curled up in a fetal position under the covers. And for the next 20-some years, never did dancing or anything like that until finally the universe confronted him with it, took away all the other options to do, 
and he ended up being in The Lion King, the traveling national production, and <clears throat> excuse me, and a bunch of other stuff. I get emotional with this sort of stuff, excuse me, once in a while. Um, and, and just other stuff. And today he's a wonderful, fabulous singer, dancer, spiritual teacher, because that was the other thing that he wanted to be was a teacher. But we sometimes get shamed, we sometimes get shut down early on, and so we stop listening to our intuition. So I invite you to be gentle in the process of bringing that back in. Because oftentimes we have pain associated with that. And so be gentle with yourself as you bring it back in. Do not shut up all over yourself. Do not beat yourself up. Learn the language of intuition. It's different for each of us. Some people see, see things. Some people hear things. Some people get a kinesthetic sort of feeling. I have a, uh, several friends who, who have what, I call, what they refer to as God bumps. You know, sometimes it's a little feeling of just a, what I call the click inside, just that little settling inside. You just start paying attention to it. What does it feel like? What does it feel like for me? And sometimes you'll have multiple ways of doing it. I've had it scream loudly at me sometimes. And sometimes it's been just this really quiet, deep knowing. Just start to practice it, listen to it. What, is it. what does it sound like? Learn that feeling. So I invite you this week to spend some time to take something that you would like to have as a shift on in your life, that maybe especially if you feel a little bit stuck on it. And again, big or small. And take some time to get quiet and then to go into the silence, deeper than the quiet, to move into the silence. And then from that, ask, what do I need to know about this? What is the highest vision about this? What do I need to become in order to allow this to happen? What do I need to let go of in order to allow this to happen? Take the time to do that this week. Practice just listening to your intuition. Practice just being aware. I'm, I heard a little hunch about that. I heard a little nuance about that. Practice listening. Intuition opens up a whole new universe within ourselves. I was, I was looking at something yesterday on, online, one of the ministers had posted, that a number of years ago they took the Hubble Space Telescope and they focused it on a patch that to everybody's eye had nothing in it. It was an absolute, I mean, they'd already you know, done the, tel the telescope to that, that area, and there was this little dark patch where there was just nothing. They said, wonder what would happen if we just focused on that for about 10 days to look really, really deep into that nothing. And they're sitting there going, it's like, you know, what kind of trouble are we going to get into? This is expensive to move the telescope around, you know, up in space. And, and to, you know, it's like, you know, we're going to be laughed at if there's really truly nothing there. But they did it anyways. They, they took a chance. They did it anyways. And they shone it into this, this patch of nothingness. It was basically about the size of a grain of sand held out at arm's length for 10 days. What they discovered, what they discovered was 100 billion new galaxies, not stars. Galaxies. Galaxies. Take that into your consciousness for a moment if you even can. We don't have a reference for it. There's areas that we've looked at where we think there's nothing to be done here. But if we'll look long enough with our intuition, we'll find galaxies of things to do there. So I invite you this week to open up to new galaxies of possibility in your life. To take this time to listen to that intuition, to let it be your telescope, your Hubble telescope, that sees deeper into consciousness, your consciousness and the infinite consciousness than you ever have before. I'm going to close with a reading from Ernest Holmes. The Great Awakening. It says, and when he came to himself, this is the Great Awakening, the moment in which we now live. In this moment, we are asking the que this question of ourselves. Is there not plenty in the universe? Why do we want? In this divine awakening, there seems to be an inner witness who remembers that we came from a heavenly state. There seems to be an answer from that great within which says, the Father's house is filled with peace, power, and plenty. The universe is not limited. It is abundant, lavish, extravagant. Nothing can be taken from 
nor added to it. Creation is the play of life upon itself. We know by intuition that there is something beyond what we have so far consciously experienced in this world. Poets have sung of it, and there are moments in the lives of all when the veil seems thin between, and we almost enter into the heavenly estate. This is the meaning of coming to oneself. We are still in the awakening state. We have not yet consciously entered the state of perfect wholeness. We know that such a state is a reality and that we shall attain this reality. Nothing can dislodge this inner and intuitive perception from our mentality. We know it is certainly as we know that we live. This is God in us, knowing itself. So I invite you to join with God in knowing yourself. If you're good enough for God, and you are, you're good enough for you. Let's pray. And so in that infinite presence, just contemplating that presence, that which layers hundreds of billions of galaxies upon more and more. That today even scientists say there are multiple what we would call universes. How vast, how infinite, how beautiful, how beyond comprehension that is, and yet we are one of it. Because it is infinite and therefore there is nowhere else to be but within that. What we call universe, or what we call wilderness, the infinite calls home. And we are there. And so I speak my word that this week we awaken to how magnificent we truly are. That this week we take that time to listen to that voice within us that has constantly been broadcasting to us the message of love, the message of wisdom, the message of abundance, the message of life and health and vitality. We take the time to set aside all the other noise and listen in that silence to that beautiful broadcast that's coming from within and all around us. We say yes to that infinite love. We say yes to that infinite wisdom. We say yes to a deeper, more profound experience and expression of ourselves than we have ever had before. We let ourselves be that. We let ourselves be who we truly are, God in form. And so in gratitude for all the outpouring of good, for all that will be seen, for all that will be manifested, that where it looks like there was nothing, there's actually a beautiful richness, a garden, of galaxies of good manifesting in our lives. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for all the good that is moving in and through and as each individual person here right this moment, right now. That simply by hearing this, something awakens within us. By hearing the possibility, something within us says, yes, I have known this and I want to experience it and express it more than I ever have before. And I'm grateful for the expression that comes out of that. And I call it all good. And we release it. We let the universe do the how. We don't have to. We don't have to figure it out. We just get to listen and dance. And the universe takes care of the rest. So it does. Together we say, and so it is. Thank you.